ladies and gentlemen on behalf of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka Center for Banking Studies it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you joining us virtually today to attend the second of the public seminar series for 2022 and this one being a special one on the occasion of women's day the theme for this year's international women's day is gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow the hashtag for the campaign break the bias is to go beyond simple knowledge that a bias exists and to really rally people to work towards a world which is equitable inclusive and free from bias and discrimination so that the playing field is level for women to progress forward um to set the tone today uh for today's proceedings we have with us deputy governor of the central bank of sri lanka mrs ivet fernando many of you who are joining us would know her as one of the movers and shakers of the economy with over 3 decades of experience in the areas of supervision and regulation of banks foreign exchange management and currency management she continues to be at the helm of financial system stability with that brief introduction let me invite deputy governor of central bank of sri lanka mrs ivet fernando to share some opening thoughts with us over to you manav okay uh, good afternoon to all first of all on behalf of the central bank of sri lanka It's my great pleasure to very warmly welcome the speaker today, Mrs. Sahida Bari, former Deputy Solicitor General of Attorney General's Department, for accepting our invitation to deliver a lecture on women and the workplace, and all of you in the audience who have joined with us this evening. The immeasurable contribution of women towards a sustainable society is undeniable. even though women are delivering a lot to contribute to the growth of their families and eventually the whole economy all such efforts may not be acknowledged their contribution is mostly seen as a supportive or complementary factor even though it is much more in most instances focusing on the topic of today's public seminar According to the latest available quarterly report of the Sri Lanka Labour Force Survey by the Department of Census and Statistics as per the second quarter of 2021 the labour force participation rate of women in Sri Lanka is around 31% the unemployment rate of women stands at 7.7% while the unemployment rate of men is reported at 3.8% the unemployment rate of women who have passed advanced level examination or obtained a higher level qualification stands at 12.5% while the unemployment among men in the same category is only 6.1% therefore as numbers speak it is clear that sri lanka has not yet realized the full potential of women's participation as far as the labor force is concerned even while Sri Lankan women having a very high literacy rate of 92.2%. So there should be some valid reasons for this disparity. However, Sri Lanka can be proud of its standing of women in society compared to its regional peers. Sri Lanka elected world's first female prime minister Mrs Sirimau Banda in 1960 and also produced number of leading female professionals in different disciplines apart from that several women have been able to secure key positions of many organizations and play a key role in the development drive of our country this clearly shows the capacity women have in driving and contributing to the economy in the central bank of sri lanka the gender composition of officers is skewed in favor of women who account for around 54%. Needless to say in our cultural context women are expected to do more in maintaining the balance of her work life and family. There is a very heavy burden on them in caring for their family compared to the male counterpart even though women are sharing equal level of responsibilities in the workplace. but whether women always get adequate recognition for that care factor she provides to the family and the society is questionable and in the workplace at times it is reported that a woman faces 
number of issues that creates a more challenging environment for her, while the severity of these issues may vary in different jobs. Coming back to low female labor participation in Sri Lanka, what is essential is to create a conducive environment within the country to encourage women to take part in the labor force. This lack of engagement of women in the labor force is raising a valid concern given the fact that a lot had been invested in educating them through fiscal provisions. What is important to realize is that there is no absolute necessity to treat women in a special manner and give them that priority in the society. The only thing that they need is an encouraging employment structure backed by fair treatment. The women will deliver the rest. Such initiative will not only honor a fundamental human right, but also lays a necessary foundation for a prosperous and sustainable economy. Kofi Annan has once said, when women thrive, all of society benefits. Also to quote Tian Wei of CCTV News, any society that falls to harness the energy and creativity of its women is at a huge disadvantage in the modern world. And Esti Lord has said, I never dreamed about success. I worked for it. Thus, Central Bank believes this time sensitive topic, women and the workplace would be highly beneficial to focus our attention on realizing the potential of Sri Lankan women and getting their contribution to uplift the economic growth. So, to speak about women and the workplace, we have today Mrs. Sahida Bari, and on behalf of the Central Bank, I thank Mrs. Bari for accepting our invitation. Now it's over to you, Ms. Punguta Ratnamudri. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fernando, for setting the tone for today's proceedings, bringing together a lot of invaluable insights on female labor force participation, and of course, the challenges of women in the workplace and at home and also some really interesting thoughts from uh, several leading professionals from across the world. Thank you so much, Madam, for those thoughts. With that note, for today's public seminar, commemorating International Women's Day, we have with us Mrs. Shahida Bari. Her two and a half decades of service as a legal professional began in the United Kingdom, where she secured a pupillage at a leading barrister's chamber in the Quadrant Chambers for a period of three years, after which her home country called on her service leading her to join in the Attorney General's Department in 1999 as a State Counsel. Over the years, she rose to the rank of a Deputy Solicitor General, providing services as a counsel and advisor to the state and discharging a supervisory role in respect of several areas of, the work, of work at the Attorney General's Department. Alongside her professional career, she has been in the constant pursuit of academic excellence, reading for the postgraduate degree of Bachelor of Civil Law from the University of Oxford, and a master's in international legal studies specializing in business law from the American University Washington College of Law. She is also the recipient of several scholarships, including the Commonwealth Scholarship uh, by the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission of the United Kingdom and the Hubert Humphrey Fellowship by the Fulbright Commission and the Government of the United States. She is also a member of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators of the United Kingdom. Ms. Bari has just retired from the Attorney General's Department and has reverted to the private bar out on a mission to break the glass ceilings. Therefore, it is apt that she is today's speaker in commemoration of International Women's Day on the topic, Women and the Workplace. Through her talk, she hopes to take us all on a journey to the past and bring us back into the present and of course, take us into the future. She will dwell on the numerous challenges overcome by women over the years and reflect on the law and policy on women at the workplace today. On that note, let me invite Mrs. Shahida Bari to deliver her lecture today titled Women and the Workplace. Over to you, Ms. Bari. Thank you, Ms. Ratna Vaduel. Thank you so much. Good, good evening, everyone. Uh, when I was invited to deliver this commemoration address for International Women's Day, the topic Women and the Workforce, or rather, women and the workplace just sprang to my mind. I think it is because as a working mother, I consider myself one among the multitude of women in the workforce 
striving to give their best at work and at home to manifest the best versions of themselves. In my mind, an address on the topic of women and the workforce would not be complete without a historical survey. Where were we? How far have we come? And where do we go from here? Are the questions we need to pose. So I propose in the course of my speech to look at the past, assess the present, and reflect on the future of women in the workforce. In looking at the past, this third century poem by a Chinese poet would be a good place to start, I think. If I may, bitter it is to have a woman's shape. It would be hard to name a thing more base. If it's a son born to hearth and home, he comes to earth as if he's heaven sent. Heroic heart and will, like the four seas, to face 10,000 leagues of wind and dust. To breed a girl is something no one wants. She is not a treasure to her family. These words aptly reflect the sorry status of women in many ancient societies. In ancient Rome, for instance, the job of a woman was to be a housekeeper and to raise children. She passed from paternal authority to the husband's authority. And even a rich widow needed a man to guard her fortune. Women belonging to wealthy families didn't work, but the poor women had to work for survival. Slave women worked as servants, housekeepers, or personal maids. Similarly, in ancient Greece, women were considered an inferior species. Philosophers considered that women had powerful emotions and low brains, and they needed protection from themselves. Each woman had her own guardian. The husband or the closest male member of the family who had the control over her life. She could, of course, own clothes, jewelry, personal slaves, but not much more. Citizenship offered women the right to marry a citizen, but no other political or economic rights. Women had the duty to bear legitimate children and to look after the house. Of course, certain exceptions did exist in ancient society. For instance, in ancient Egypt, women were supposed to enjoy a higher degree of rights. In certain Eastern civilizations too, there were matriarchal societies headed by women. But by and large, women, if one were to extract a universal norm, Women had no voting rights, no property rights, no say in governance, and no personal freedom. With the rise of organized religion, religious texts were being interpreted through the prism of men, and social norms were being set and enforced also by the physically dominant males of the human species. Naturally, patriarchy was institutionalized and perpetuated. Therefore, the participation of women in the workforce and their contribution to economic and social development in a meaningful way was quite negligible. The history of women in the workforce remained largely the same throughout the Middle Ages and the medieval times. In the age of entitlement, uh, rather in the age of enlightenment around 1650 in Europe, things slowly began to change. The idea dawned that women could in fact 
B as competent as men, and that what was holding them in shackles was not the lack of intelligence, but the want of education. British writer and philosopher Mary Wollstonecraft, in her 1792 book, A Vindication of the Rights of Women, wrote that, a, that women are human beings deserving of the same fundamental rights as men, and that treating them as mere ornaments or property of men undercuts the moral foundation of society. Yet, at the time, there was little positive affirmative action to change the lot of women, even though there was a recognition that the women, what the woman lacked was education and not intelligence. What do you think then caused the change? The catalyst for change, ladies and gentlemen, was profit. Alexander Hamilton, a founding father of the United States, wrote in his report on manufacturers in 1791, one of the biggest areas of opportunity to develop industry in the USA was cheap labor in the form of women and children. Soon afterwards, in the United States, employers began to follow Hamilton's suggestion. In 1820, textile mills in New England started hiring young women from surrounding farms as workers, paying them low wages. When advanced machinery and technology reduced the need for skilled labor, more women were allowed to enter the labor force. Women continued to gradually enter the workforce across America and most other industries industrialized nations over the course of the 19th century. After the US Civil War in the 1800s, the role of women in the workforce did change considerably. Almost 600,000 American men died and hundreds and thousands more were injured. So more and more women were forced to enter the labor force. But again, married women were not hired by private employees. Later, as women and men were competing for the same jobs, there was a considerable opposition from men in the USA. During the Great Depression in around 1920, some male-dominated trade unions revived the argument that only men were entitled to hold jobs. Nevertheless, over time, women were able to gradually overcome some of these obstacles. You see, before the 20th century, housework was so time consuming that married women did not have the time to engage in the workforce. But with new technology in the home, it made it easier for women to do paid work outside their homes. In the 20th century, as the economy itself changed and the service industries grew, it created more opportunities for women. In 1910, the first policewoman was appointed in Los Angeles. In 1940, the first policewoman was appointed in Britain. Women were allowed to become solicitors, barristers, vets, chartered accountants, magistrates, and members of, jury, members of juries, and such like. It was World War II that would permanently change the role of women in the workforce. In America, for instance, as men went off to war, women began to take jobs that were previously only held by men. During World War II, million new women workers entered the labor force. Six million, rather. Six million new women workers entered the labor force, taking jobs in heavy industry, 
and other previously male dominated industries. After the World War II, large number of women were forced to relinquish their, relinquish their jobs to returning veterans. However, resilient women continued to enter the workforce in record numbers. Some of the more popular positions held by women during the World War period, or rather the post-World War period, included some degree of office work, retail sales, nursing, teaching, and other so-called feminine occupations. What do you think then was the most significant change for women in the workplace? I say it was capitalism. Capitalist society laid the foundation for the most radical of change towards labor. All previous societies were based on sexual division of labor. It went without saying that certain occupations were reserved for men and others for women. For the first time in history, capitalism eliminated this division and transformed labor into something abstract. Before, there was concrete labor of peasants, of artisans, and so on. Now, however, there was labor power, accounted by the R or by piecework. Who actually does the job would not be material. With the development of machinery, work demands less and less physical strength, and more and more women are entering domains once reserved for men. The old prejudices about women's supposed irrationality are dying away. More and more women are to be found in the scientific and medical professions, once thought only suitable for supposedly more rational men. With colonization, the developments in the Western Hemisphere gradually percolated to most of the globe. As globalization took hold and the market economy pervaded the world, archaic social norms regarding the role of women in the workplace began to gradually change universally. And today, if we take Sri Lanka, here too, we have women heading state and corporate sector institutions. And as just mentioned by Mrs. Yvette Fernando, most of the staff at the central bank, or rather the, the ratio of staff at the central bank, are more in is more in favor of women. As a lawyer, my review would be incomplete if I do not dwell on the role played by the law in moving this transformation of women from chattel to chairperson. Let me start with the most significant piece of legislation that happened in the UK in 1990. The Sex Disqualification Removal Law in the UK opened certain professions hitherto closed to women to enter, for women to enter. An example is the legal profession. So women could become barristers and solicitors. In 1963, in the USA, an Equal Pay Act compelled employers to pay men and women the same amount for doing the same job. The most important moment for women in the workforce came in 1964 with the passage of the Civil Rights Act in the USA. The act outlawed all forms of discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. So this laid the foundation for equality among women and men. At an international level, on the 18th of December 1979, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly. This convention is more popularly known 
as the seed of convention. The United Nations Commission on the Status of Women was then established in 19, was established earlier in 1946 to monitor the situation of women and to promote women's rights. The Commission's work has been instrumental in bringing to light all the areas in which women are denied equality with men. There are also numerous international labor organization conventions and recommendations which set out international labor standards relating to gender equality at work. The ILO work includes the Equal Remuneration Convention, the Distribution within brackets Employment and Occupation Convention, the Workers with Family Responsibilities Convention, the Maternity Protection Convention, and more recently, the Violence and Harassment Convention of 2019. The gender perspectives are mainstreamed through many other ILO instruments as well, such as instruments on working time, part-time work, home-based work, social security, occupational safety and health, and domestic work. Turning to Sri Lanka, in terms of Article 12.1 of our own constitution, all persons are equal before the law and are entitled to equal protection of the law. Therefore, the Grund norm, as it were, of our legal structure is that there cannot be discrimination against women in the workplace. Our labor laws too have specific provisions dedicated to women and children. And this is there from very early times. I will first take you to the Employment of Women, Young Persons and Children's Act, 1973. This act regulates employment in industrial undertakings. Section 2A says, no woman shall be compelled to work at night against her will. So basically, night work for women is strictly regulated. If women are to be engaged in night work, the law provides that written sanction of the commissioner of labor should be obtained by every employer prior to the employment by him of a woman to work after 10 p.m. at night. No woman who has been employed during the hours of 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. shall be employed after 10 p.m. Every woman who works at night should be paid not less than one and a half times the normal payment received by her. There shall be appointed a female warden to see to the welfare of the woman workers who work at night. Every woman worker working at night shall be provided with restrooms and refreshments by the employer. And no woman shall be employed for more than 10 days on night work during one month. Of course, this only applies to a certain category of female workers. The provisions that I just read do not apply to women holding responsible positions of a managerial and technical character, to women employed in health and welfare services who are not ordinarily engaged in manual work, and C, to an industrial undertaking in which only members of the same family are employed. With regard to maternity benefits, we have the Maternity Benefits Act 1939, which says that no employer shall knowingly employ a woman worker at any time during the period of four weeks immediately following her confinement. So in terms of Section 3.1 of that Act, the period for which any woman worker shall be entitled to the payment of maternity benefit shall be 12 weeks, that is to say, two weeks up to and including the day of her confinement and 10 weeks immediately following that day if the confinement results in the issue of a live child. 
then six weeks, that is to say two weeks up to and including the day of a confinement, and four weeks immediately following that day, if the confinement does not result in the issue of a live child. It should also be noted that the employer of a worker shall pay such woman worker maternity benefits at the prescribed rates. So not only is she entitled to leave, she's entitled to paid leave. And this leave is in addition to any holiday leave she may already be entitled to. So it, the uh, already existing holiday leave cannot be accumulated and lumped together for the purposes of maternity leave. It's a distinct and separate uh, category of leave that is that the women are entitled to as maternity leave. The employment of a woman worker cannot be terminated by reason only of a pregnancy or confinement, or for that matter, any illness consequent on a pregnancy or confinement where a woman worker gives notice to her employer that she is expected to be in confinement within such period, not exceeding three months. So within that period, she cannot effectively be terminated. It is also important to note that during that time, the employer is prohibited from engaging the woman in any type of work which would be injurious to her or her child. Section 11.1 of that Act says that no notice of dismissal given without sufficient cause by an employer to a woman worker within a period of five months before her confinement shall have the effect of depriving her of any maternity benefits to which she, but for such notice, she would have been or would on or before the date of her confinement have become entitled under the ordinance. Now, the liability of an employer to pay any sum of money as maternity benefits to a woman worker employed by him shall be a first charge on the assets of that trade. What does this mean? This means that if the employer or the company that is employing the woman worker goes bankrupt or refuses to pay, the maternity benefit dues are given priority because it is a charge on the assets of the company or the employer. So that uh, provision gives primacy to the maternity entitlement of the woman. Section 12A1 says, the employer of more than a prescribed number of women workers in any trade shall establish and maintain in accordance with regulations made in that behalf, a creche for children under five years of age and shall allow any such worker who has in her care the child or children under five years of age to leave such child or children in such creche during the hours when she's required to work for her employer. The minister may, for the purposes of this section, prescribe a number for a a number for a trade or a branch of a trade, having regard to the number of women workers employed in and the nature of the work a woman worker is required to perform in such trade or such branch. In terms of section 12b, the employer of a woman worker in any trade shall, if she is nursing a child under, year, under one year of age, allow her in any period of nine hours, two nursing intervals at such times as she may require. So even after the maternity leave, when you return to work, an employee's in, employee is entitled to two nursing intervals at such times as she may require. And each interval shall, where a fresh or other suitable place is provided by such an employer to such worker for nursing such child, be not less than 30 minutes, and where no crash is provided, it shall be not less, uh, it, it can be, it can go up to one hour. And it shall be in addition to an interval period 
to such worker for meals or rest under any written law. So for nursing, there is this additional entitlement of time that the mother is uh, provided by law. We can now turn to the factories ordinance of 1942. Subject to the provisions of this part, the hours worked, the period of employment and the intervals for meals and rest for every woman or young person employed in a factory shall conform to the following conditions, it says. Namely, the total hours worked, exclusive of intervals allowed for meals and rest, shall neither exceed nine in any day nor exceed 48 in any week. A woman or young person shall not be employed continuously for a spell of more than four hours and four and a half hours without an interval of at least half an hour for meals or rest. The factory's ordinance also covers night work and overtime. Then what of ladies who are employed in shops and offices? In this regard, the relevant act is the Shop and Office Employees Act of 1954 as amended. Section 18B of that act says, subject to the provisions of subsection 3, a female employee to whom this part applies shall upon giving notice to her employer that she expects to be confined within 14 days from the date specified in the notice, be entitled to leave for a period commencing on that day and ending on the day immediately preceding the day of her confinement, and her employer shall allow such leave. This act also regulates working hours for women, providing sanitary conveniences and washing facilities for women, seats for female shop assistants, then, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, maternity benefits within uh, and within shops and offices in the country. During maternity leave, the remuneration should be paid. Injurious work is prohibited during pregnancy. Employees cannot be terminated during pregnancy. And the leave, the maternity leave, is something that is given in addition to the regular leave. Workers in shops and offices are also entitled to nursing intervals given to those workers in the industries. So, all in all, by the end of the 20th and beginning of the 21st century or so, many women had literally blazed the trail. Starting with our own Sirimavu Bandarnayaka and Chandrika Bandarnayaka Kumarakamba, who were the first female prime minister and president, respectively, in the entire world. We had the Marie Curie and Rosalind Franklin who have bled the field of science. And Indira Gandhi's, the Margaret Thatcher's, the Angela Merkel's, the Jacinda Ardern's, and so on and on the list goes. Notwithstanding these trailblazers though, we need to pause and ponder. Is this the real story for women across the board? What of ordinary women? What prey is their lot? If we turn to Sri Lanka, statistics show that the majority of students entering universities in various segments are women. But somewhere down the line, many of them simply go into the woodworks without formal integration into the workforce. Even those who do enter the workforce rarely make it to the top of the ladder as key decision makers and industry leaders. Leadership roles in Sri Lanka are largely held by men. The woman CEO does exist, but this is rare and a celebrated exception. So there is a strong tradition of both men and women working in Sri Lanka. Men focus more on income opportunities and women focus on the household. Currently, women's participation in, paid, in the paid labor force 
is concentrated in professions like nursing, teaching, tea plucking, and garment construction. In the manufacture and agricultural work, men are typically assigned tasks considered more physically demanding, while women are assigned to more repetitive, detail-oriented work at which they are thought to be better than men. Opportunities for work, foreign employment for women too are largely restricted to domestic work, whereas opportunities for men are more varied, ranging from manual labor to engineering. When it comes to maternity leave, which we just discussed, the private sector females are entitled only to 12 weeks of maternity leave, compared to almost a year's leave available for those in the public sector. The challenge in Sri Lanka's private sector is that in the absence of a state-supported uh, maternity leave system, the employer is liable to pay for the maternity leave. Therefore, increasing the period of leave becomes necessarily a challenge. Further, even though pregnancy cannot be a basis of termination, in trying times such as these, it has been observed by officials monitoring labor issues that services of pregnant women are in fact terminated on other spurious grounds. Ultimately, the reality for most women is that within the home, regardless of their engagement in paid labor, women and girls do all of the food preparation and most other domestic work. A UN Women's Report on Sri Lanka records that women's labor force participation rate is a mere 32.5% in comparison to 72.4% of men. Similarly, the youth unemployment rate for women is at 36.3% compared to 21.1% for men. Women's labor force participation in the country is often compounded by many factors, such as lack of affordable and quality childcare services, lack of support in sharing household work, and some workplace cultures that are not supportive of women employees. Because of this social conditioning and uh, entrenched segregation of gender roles that are vestiges of the past, often working women with children are consumed by what I would term the guilty mother complex and often abandon their professional careers. This is not a phenomenon limited to Sri Lanka. Recently, a report by the ILO shows that despite women's expressed preference for paid jobs, socioeconomic factors, and prevailing social norms continue to obstruct their participation in paid employment. The constraints are often directly linked to the disproportionate burden of unpaid care and household responsibilities that women have to assume, which restricts both the educational and employment opportunities they can access and their ability to participate in the labor market. Further, as many women are engaged in informal employment, crises such as COVID-19 have disproportionately affected female-headed households. Is it not ironic that with the workplace embracing women, the woman seems to have passed upon herself a dual burden, one, to contribute financially to the family unit and at the same time carry the primary care burden for the children and sometimes even the elderly in the family. This takes a heavy toll on the woman. Also, even if women are in paid employment, it is rarely sufficient to take them out of the poverty line and to escape poverty. The International Labour Organization reports suggest that women constitute a higher share of the low wage workforce and that they are more likely than men in some countries to be 
merely supplementing another household income. A significant proportion of this gap is due to overrepresentation of women in sectors and occupations with a higher incidence of low pay. So a larger majority of women are employed in sectors that have very low pay. In Sri Lanka, a 2021 report by an institution known as the Solidarity Center observes that even prior to the pandemic, garment workers had yet to benefit from this fast growing industry, despite its contrib considerable contribution to the economy. The women in the garment factories, they say, have endured physical abuse in addition to inadequate wages and poor working conditions. Garment sector workers, especially women, also face negative social perceptions, stigmatized as promiscuous and are referred to derogatively as juki girls. The COVID-19 pandemic heavily affected garment sector workers on many fronts. The second wave of the pandemic began in the garment industry, which led to several worker right violations, including non-payment of wages, termination and retrenchment, and worsened employment conditions, such as lack of proper transport and inadequate housing facilities for them. Might I also add here that the regulations that the previous act that I referred to mentioned in respect of pressures have not in fact been made by the minister. And therefore, though even though the law provides for uh, pressures uh, for women, this cannot be enforced in the absence of regulations being formulated. It is also to be noted that the fine for violation of most labor laws in Sri Lanka is around 500 rupees. This then breeds a culture of impunity because this fine is so small, particularly in desperate economic times such as this, employers might prefer to pay the fine than incur the higher cost of maintaining uh, a, a maternity leave for women. Even when women are in the workforce at the higher end of the scale, they are often subject to gender-based discrimination in the workplace. A striking example is the gender pay gap. Equal pay for the same work is now considered a basic human right. But time and time again, women are denied access to fair and equal wages. Recent figures are said to show that women earn roughly around 72% of what men earn for the same work. Given the high cost of living, inflation, and other care burdens taken over by women, the lower pay leads to a lifetime of financial disparity for women. It prevents them from fully exercising their independence. Because you see, the lower wages curtail their access to economic assets such as land and loans to better their lifestyles. This means an increased risk of poverty in the woman's later life. Another issue for women is the workplace uh, for women in the workplace is a gender-based harassment. Workers are often reluctant to discuss such matters due to fear of reprisal and also due to a degree of normalization of such practices in everyday work life. Additionally, even though gender-based harassment issues are prevalent in broader Sri Lankan societies, women rarely share their stories. This can be due to many reasons such as victim blaming, fear, guilt, and modesty, which are kind of instilled through norms of social conformity. I now turn to informality of labor. This is a more modern phenomenon that brings with it 
a new set of regulatory challenges with outsourcing of human capital and the manpower agency trend, leave rights and wages may be difficult to monitor and enforce by the authorities. In the manpower sector, it is said that female laborers do not receive statutory employment benefits, such as provident fund contributions, and also have a number of difficulties in securing their deals. Similarly, the new work from home culture, though positive in most respects, could exacerbate the burden of female workers as it blurs the line between work and home, and it could also mean a challenge for the regulators who are, whose laws are geared to regulate women working within an office or a industrial environment. So many of those, many women could fall through the cracks when working from home. This survey of women in the workplace would be incomplete without touching on the problems and challenges faced by migrant women workers. Their remittance contribution uh, adds, adds significantly to the Sri Lankan economy, but what about their working conditions? In the data of the Sri Lanka Bureau of Foreign Employment in the year 2020, out of the total of 5,130 complaints received from migrant workers, 3,052 were from domestic housekeeping assistants, who, as you all know, are primarily women or exclusively women. Further, between 2015 and 2020, there were 159 deaths by suicide. And no doubt, a significant percentage must have been women, even though that particular data set is not available it can easily be inferred that a significant portion of those suicides were women. The limited legal recourse in respect of breach of employment contracts, harassment, non-payment of wages, etc., are problems that often go under the radar in respect of the migrant women employee and drive these women to desperation. The ILO World Employment Social Outlook 2018 has this to say. Gender gaps in the labor force participation remains wide. Women are more likely than men to be unemployed in large parts of the world. Then vulnerable employment is more severe for women in developing countries. Informality remains pervasive among women in emerging and developing countries. Working poverty is widespread among men and women, but gender gaps in the labor market aggravates the social protection gaps. Significant additional efforts are required to close the gender gaps in the labor force. So this is the 2018 outlook of the International Labor Organization. Indeed, women, as we all know, account for more than 50% of the population of the world. This means 50% of the potentially productive workforce. This is why the UN Sustainable Development Goals include a specific focus on women. It says, the, it, it strives for the achievement of full and productive employment and decent work for all women and men, and the protection of labor rights and promotion of safe and secure working environments for all workers, including migrant workers, in particular women migrants and those in precarious employment. There are many proposals for reform being discussed in the policy sphere. Some proposals considered by women's rights advocates include state-sponsored maternity benefits, 
better child care mandates, driving social engineering to engineer social change, to mainstream the idea that caregiving is the, a social responsibility and not for the female person alone. There is also a drive to create access to social and economic opportunities for women and to empower women within their own socio-economic levels, to give them the freedom to fly, to give them the finances, to facilitate their own jobs, businesses, and to build the capacity of women to fly into their own spheres where they find freedom of employment and of opportunity. In that regard, much emphasis has been laid on capacity building, including in key fields like technology and the STEM sector. However, in developing countries like Sri Lanka, struggling for the dollar to bring bread to the table, the issues faced by women at the workplace becomes a minor policy priority. As the state coffers are tight, enhancing women's rights gets imposed on the employer, which necessarily impacts on the employer's profit margin, at least in the short term. Hence, the resistance begins. In poor countries with inadequate social welfare, clearly capitalism that drove the woman to the workforce has also placed them in a bind. It is the responsibility, therefore, of every human person to break that bind and unleash the capacity of women to contribute productively to the workforce. It is unfortunate, though, that the call for enhancement of the dignity and capacity of women in the workplace is misunderstood. Sometimes it's militant feminism and has somehow been anti-male. Let me correct this misapprehension. Women are unique and different from the male person as they give their bodies to carry and feed a child and thereby subjugate their own needs to care for others and to benefit society at large and to perpetuate humankind. Therefore, a biological difference alone cannot be considered a basis of a social structure that places women at an economic disadvantage and to socially deprive women. After all, women remain 50% of the work workforce. And I'm sure no one is advocating going back to the barbaric e era of infanticide or female offspring. Therefore, even if one puts social justice norms aside and focuses focus purely on the economic terms, they sh it is important that women, the 50% of women in the world, are productively integrated into the workforce. Therefore, even in developing countries, policy choices, though difficult, should be made to reap rewards in the long term. Let's not forget in this context that the Charter of the United Nations reaffirms the faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person and in the equal rights of men and women. I think I have said enough to demonstrate that development for the world at large will only be sustainable if it accrues equally to women and men, because women also are a significant part of the workforce. And women are unproductive, that is going to be detrimental to the human well-being at large. Dear human person who are listening to me today, I end my speech with this entreaty that dignity for women in the workforce should be viewed not just as her 
problem, but as our problem affecting all human persons and not just women alone. Well, before I end, remember I started this speech with a dreary poem on women. So let me leave you celebrating Women's Day and hoping for a better tomorrow with this lovely song, which I invite uh, the staff to play at this moment. In numbers too big to ignore And I know too much to go back and pretend Cause I've heard it all before And I've been down there on the floor And no one's ever gonna keep me down again Oh yes, I am wise But it's wisdom gonna pay Yes, I pay the price Uh, Miss Vari, I think you have to unmute yourself, please. On that note, I thank the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, the Center for Banking Studies. This is uh, Yvette Fernando, who took her time to introduce the session. Miss Ratna Vadivel for introducing me and everybody else who's present here today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Miss Vari, for those insightful thoughts. A long journey. Um,
through the progress of women, where they stand in society, the regulatory frameworks, what we should, what are the challenges women in Sri Lanka are facing, and of course, what small tips, small insights into uh, what the work that has to be done going forward. Um, with that, we'll also open the floor to questions and um, we have received a few questions in the chat box and if you would like to continue engaging with us, our participants today, um, you can continue to ask and uh, drop in your questions through the Q&A box or through the chat box. So um, we will take some of the questions that we already have and uh, one of the questions that our attendees has posed is um, in today's working environment, working late tends to be inevitable. And you also spoke about the Shop and Officers Act, where you have some um, where you have some conditions regarding women who are working late hours. So if you can, um, they're asking for a little bit of explanation for some further explanation on um, the same question of uh, women having to work late hours. And also maybe you, if you could um, share some experiences, um, Ms. Bari, from your own legal uh, perspectives, that is your own legal perspectives on how this problem can be addressed in a way that is favorable to both women and to employers. Over to you, Ms. Bari. Yes, sir. I think your last point is, is the sticking point most often because it's often a financial burden to provide for the safety and security of women. And therefore, because it is not considered a social issue and merely an issue for the bottom line and the profit, it sort of it, this is not considered an investment that is worth the while. So that is the root of the problem. But with regard to how one were to uh, one is to address the uh, working times in shops and offices, the, uh, the the requirements as to time which I spoke about is uh, largely the the time requirements are imposed with regard to industries and factories. So with regard to management work, as I uh, mentioned during the course of my lecture as well, the time restrictions do not apply with regard to people engaged in a higher level of management. So there, there's a discretion uh, for the, it, it is understood, I think, that at that level, uh, there's sufficient sort of power, a, a bargaining power to uh, negotiate your working hours and that there may not be a strict necessity for the law to uh, step in. But having said that, that is that thus far that the law has gone. I'm not for a moment saying that the, uh, the necessity to provide for all of this is not there, but that is where I ended my talk, you see. There is far to go in terms of implementing uh, or, or uh, firstly, in, in terms of formulating laws and implementing laws for to, to secure the rights of women. So without actually knowing what type of workplace the person is uh, working for, I'm unable to give a specific view as to what their rights are. And I wouldn't want this to be a forum to advise somebody on their labor rights without knowing uh, what type of employment they're engaged in. But what I would like to emphasize is that the uh, most of the laws with regard to time are at the low end of the workforce, where there are a large number of workers at the low end of pay who might be exploited and made to work long hours. Of course. And um, another question, uh, Ms. Wari, is uh, from another one of our viewers that is on um, what you think should be done to address social conditioning against women in the workplace. And we had already, I mean, you had already touched upon this regarding the dual burden of women and how uh, women are seen as caregivers. Actually, now we, I think now the terminology has turned into the triple burden of women, that is women as mothers, wives, and also women as workers, and also women as members of community and their overall contribution to community. So um, that is the question uh, on what should be done to address social conditioning against women in the workplace. And also um, there's a follow-up question on whether in your opinion, laws and regulations in Sri Lanka and the enforcement mechanism to ensure gender equality is adequate right now. If you can share some thoughts. Yes. Do you think the laws and regulations in Sri Lanka and the enforcement mechanism is adequate? No. That the uh, even sort of, I think uh, the survey I took you through, all of those laws are very old laws. Of course, as we say in, as lawyers, we say 
Act number such and such 1939 as amended, which means they have been amended over time. But what that signifies is that there has not been a fundamental rethinking of the underlying norms. There is the old 1939 law or the 1940 whatever law where the social structure was totally different. And the, uh, those laws have been tinkered with to uh, sort of give redress to little problems that are uh, perceived as sufficiently important to move in terms of policy. But the overall structural changes have not come. The, as I said, even the regulation for pressures which the law provides for have not been implemented. And therefore, it is not enforceable. Leave alone sort of going through a total policy shift with regard to how women are perceived. I think uh, with regard to the legal momentum towards change that has been uh, created, that has to be created by the legal instrument uh, instruments have not happened. And with regard to the first, the previous question, I think the other question you raised is how do I think the perspectives of society vis-a-vis -vis the gender roles can differ? Uh, this is a personal view, purely personal view, not so much a view as a lawyer. But what I realize that in countries like Sri Lanka, we are deeply entrenched in uh, our uh, individual uh, sort of norms and religions. So, and religious texts are interpreted, as I said, through the prison of men. But in my, my mind, the foundation for many of the religions, the organized religions of the world have been women. Would Jesus Christ have been nurtured and protected if not for Mother Mary? Would not Prince Siddhartha have walked out of his house had he not been secure in the knowledge that Princess Yasodhara would look after his infant child? And as, as a Muslim, I think, would we be celebrating Hajj if, if the wife of Prophet Abraham, Hajj, didn't desperately run from one mountain to the other looking for solace for her infant child? So all of these show that it is the woman who has been the foundation for bearing the greatest religions of the world. So it is these religious norms, I think, that cast and blight the, uh, the prospect of women changing their lot. And I think it is time to, for women who practice their religions to realize that there's another perspective to this all. So if we teach our children that this, is, this perspective is can be nuanced. It is not what has been taught to us by our forefathers. There might be something different to look at. Then I think change can happen. But until those norms are in, this is purely a personal view, uh, because that is where I think uh, those norms are entrenched from. And uh, Ms. Barry, one last question uh, from our viewers. Um is on. Um, so we know that uh, you also cited this um, statistics on female labor force participation, how um, the proportion of women who are uh, in workplaces is um, relatively low or who are looking for work on the whole is relatively low. In your opinion, what do you think are the small steps? So we can talk about maternity leave, which is, um, which is another um, Akaili's heel in Sri Lanka, the fact that um, private sector it still perceives women as a burden because of maternity leave and the need to extend this maternity leave things. I mean, while we have those issues on one hand, the, the, the sticky ones on one hand, what do you think are the low hanging fruits, the easy, simple things that workplaces or employers can do to make life easier for women in the workplace or to even bring them into the workplace in the first place? Any thoughts from you, please? Um, yes, I the first thing I think is that when we say women in the workplace, even I'm guilty of having generalized women, because when we talk about workplace, we're talking of a structure, various strata of society. So if we are looking at bringing uh, more women to the conventional domain where women work, like the factories and the, uh, the uh, industrial uh, kind of pursuits, 
I think the first thing is to remove, to sort of have build social awareness drives, which remove stigmatization, to make provide for basic facilities for them, like uh, you know housing and transport, which which they probably have to incur anyway, but maybe with a little more, uh, slightly higher cost, it would sort of. Uh, Will will be. Uh, it may not be that difficult to infuse that into the running cost of the business operation. So little things like that, I think, that dignity that you attach and the social sort of the the way it's perceived. You know, the the, the girl going to the garment factory is not just a promiscuous juki girl, but somebody who's productively engaging in the economy. Because I think it it might have been lost in the you know verbal speech that I made that the that 50% of the workforce are women. So as an economist, you would agree with me. Uh, if I say that if there is, I mean, if that number of human capital is being uh, wasted, then where is the world going? So if therefore, it, I think the little things, the little things that remove the stigma, like maybe, you know, the TV programs, uh, you know, the, the discourses and discussions on the uh, on the news, uh, whatever speeches that women make, and little things like that, and maybe school curricula, it's just a matter of tinkering with the textbook, things that do not need a huge sort of investment. And I am conscious that at this point in time, our governments do not and cannot afford big budget maternity leave benefits and big budget benefits, but. I think if it, if, if it starts from the bottom with a change in mindset, I think gradually uh, and sort of uh, and also an altering of the sort of the view of men, I think it's time they also realize that the world has changed. We are not in the medieval times and we are not in an agricultural economy where men had to, there were sort of division of labor, where men and women are in this together. and. If that worldview sort of percolates into society at large, I think the cost of making that change is not going to be that much in terms of rupees and cents. True, uh, Ms. Bari. Very interesting, I mean, tidbits, because uh, as the, as the pro popular Chinese proverb goes, you know, a journey of thousand miles begins with the first step. So hopefully this discussion today and the Q&A and the insights, the very uh, specific insights that you shared today, would have served as um, the first step to this long journey that uh, Sri Lanka needs to make. Having already seen several milestones, um, having already met several milestones. So um, it, it, we hope that this will be the first step towards a very fruitful journey and the progress, the continued progress of women in Sri Lanka island wide. So with that, Miss um, uh, Bari, thank you very much and uh, for your invaluable insights and your contemporary thoughts on women, their roles in the workplace, the challenges they face, and a lot of um, details on the regulatory frameworks uh, and the legal framework that is applicable to women in Sri Lanka and how they are challenges and how some of them are beneficial and how some of them are challenges and things that we need to uh, be mindful of going forward. So thank you very much, Miss Bari, for being with us today and with that ladies and gentlemen we reach the end of today's proceedings and on behalf of the center for banking studies and the central bank of sri lanka i thank all of you who are with us today for your avid participation and do hope that you will continue to extend your enthusiasm and cooperation to us in all of our future outreach initiatives throughout this year and for the coming period periods ahead on that note let me also take this opportunity to raise a toast to strong women like Ms. bari and um, the many women that we know and uh, many women that we know around us. So may we not only know them, but may we also be them. And most importantly, may we also raise such strong women. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, and have a very pleasant evening ahead. Stay safe.